I'm your host, Kaylee, and this is Rebel Wellness. Welcome to Rebel Wellness, your new go-to podcast for redefining your health and well-being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales. I'm stoked to have you with us. You just joined a community of amazing souls who are ready to break free from the confines of the often outdated and confusing health advice all around us. In a world overwhelmed by quick fix diets and unrealistic beauty and body standards, us rebels stand for change. If you're like me, you're exhausted with the confusion and polarization just plaguing the social media health scene. My mission is to empower you to step beyond today's diet culture and adopt a holistic health approach paired with the foundations of science for lasting well-rounded wellness. Through teaching you how to tune in and embrace your mind, body, and soul, we'll reject one-size-fits-all solutions, realigning you on a better path that honors your unique needs and values. With new episodes weekly, this podcast is your new sanctuary for deep wellness exploration, featuring expert advice, real-life stories, and a true commitment to your growth. Your journey to better health and simplicity in life begins now. Let's jump right in. Welcome back to the show, Rebel. If you are new here, hello. Welcome to probably one of the more longer format episodes of topics so far on Rebel Wellness. I'm actually splitting this one into two parts because it is such a big conversation. And I wanted to make sure that you guys kind of get a good, well-rounded, in-depth approach to this topic so that you can kind of come out of this whole conversation, hopefully with a lot more understanding of all the things surrounding milks. And I'm talking M-I-L-K, M-Y-L-K, whatever you want to label it as. <laughs> we're talking nut milks, we're talking oat milks, we're talking cow milks. You know, there's a lot to be discussed around all the milks. So this is the great milk debate, part one. And it's a really highly requested episode. I've been asked so many questions about different milks, like which milk is the best? Which one has the best stuff for you? Which one should you really be avoiding? You know, and I'm actually somebody who historically does not digest milk well, cow's milk that is, because I have Japanese heritage, Filipino heritage. And so for me, um, I've always had to really navigate the milk scene kind of at a different angle than maybe a standard American diet. So this episode was really fun for me, um, or episodes rather, because I want to kind of open your mind to the angles that are available to approach milk, whether it's cow's milk or any of the other nuts or grain milks, because there's a world of milks nowadays. And I don't necessarily talk about every single one of them, but a lot of them are pretty much like cousins of each other when it comes to nuts and or grain based. And so if there's any milks that I didn't talk about in this part two part episode, I would love to hear what you wanted to learn a little bit more about, because there are definitely a lot more variations out there and um, I would love to learn about them so that I can share with you and that I can just know better on my own. But this topic today, I want to start off diving into the entire world of milk where we kind of started with it, the different concepts and uh, scientific background behind milk and talk a little bit about the milk nutrition because that's super important to understand, especially as milk has been a staple especially in the standard American diet for over a century now. And a lot of different countries have included cow's milk or goat's or sheep's milk, from milk from mammals rather, have been included in diets just for thousands of years. So this isn't something where like all of a sudden we've discovered that dairy has a dark side. <laughs> the dark side of dairy. Maybe that's what I should have named this episode. Just kidding. Because we're actually approaching it from a whole well-rounded viewpoint because I really want you to see that it's not actually the devil's milk <laughs> when it comes down to it. And it really depends on your individual body, your ethnic background. You know, there's a lot of things that come into it. So this is a really interesting conversation and I hope that you really enjoy today's topic because it is worth knowing in a time where we do demonize dairy a lot. And I will even say straight up guys, like back in the past, I used to demonize dairy too, because for me, my understanding with being lactose intolerant was just that like I couldn't tolerate dairy. So like dairy sucks, you know, and I thought dairy was the root of all my acne, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But it actually always comes down to things like the quality and 
what you eat it with and does it have already the enzymes or you know so we're going to dive into all of that today and we are really going to go straight into primarily cow's milk for this part one and stick through all the way to the end because I'm going to give you a little sneak peek into part two that will come out next Sunday. But without further ado, let's dive into this dairy topic. So today I'm going to be covering a very highly questioned topic that I have gotten literally probably my entire career and maybe even before I was a professional and certified. And that is the great milk debate. That's what we're calling it. <laughs> because there are just, there's so much noise going on uh, around anything milk. So I know that dairy is the OG milk, it's the M-I-L-K, and then plant-based, or well, I guess they all considered plant-based, milks, M-Y-L-K-S. I'm going to cover a lot of them. I may not have as much to say about some as much as others because the, it's kind of hilarious how many things are milked nowadays, but we're going to talk all about what I think is the most important things to know. A lot of this stuff is going to be probably really surprising to you. I think that especially through all of my research I did in the past and the present, especially making sure I always want to make sure that my understanding is up to date. And I've actually learned a little bit more recently about milks that I'm excited to tell you about today. So definitely stay tuned. I'm going to be giving you the top three milks that I would recommend you prioritize in your diet for most females. Again, I'm kind of speaking a little bit more towards a female's digestive system, but this actually still is very relatable and useful information for males because it's not in too different. However, you know, female humans, we create our own milk <laughs> and that actually plays a huge role. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that in a minute, but I want to make sure that you know that female gut health is different because of that. And so we're going to cross those C's as we get to them. But I do want to make sure you guys know that I'm not really going to talk about the politics today in it. There's a lot of kind of pick your side as far as leveraging what milk you drink and your maybe social status. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how else to kind of say it. And this has been my experience. I live in California. I live in Oregon. I am very much a West Coasty. I am in the line of fire of who is kind of the most up to date and setting the tone for the rest of the world. And I don't say that necessarily in a pretentious way. It's just that West Coast and East Coast the United States does statistically influence the rest of a lot of places. Not that we are necessarily superior in knowledge. It's just more that we are like the Hollywood <laughs> of all the countries. <laughs> People like our music, they like our fashion, you know, all that stuff. But again, not to say that, you know, there's places that are way superior to unique fashion like Tokyo and all that stuff. So I'm just saying all to wrap that together that we do tend to kind of push more very specific narratives around compared to other countries. <laughs> like, y'all know I'm not lying about that, you know what I mean? Especially on TikTok. <laughs> so it is kind of funny. But I will say that today's conversation is important to still consider some sort of political topics, more so environmental. It shouldn't necessarily be political, but I do just want to let you know that, you know, we do have to talk about some of that stuff because I'm not going to just talk about milks plain without the reasons a lot of people change their decisions on which milks they choose, okay? And everybody, in my mind, is allowed to make the decisions they would like for whatever works the best for their health because uh, I'm going to say something that's kind of controversial, but it's true. There's actually like, a, I believe, a Swedish company <laughs> that has environmental videos where they do like massive science um breakdowns. One person's influence, especially in the world of milks, of what they choose, makes such a nominal impact on the grand scheme of the environmental trajectory that in the end, when you're comparing tit for tat, you should prioritize your health when it comes to nutrition, you guys, because nothing we do with nutrition impacts the world as much as freaking everything else. <laughs> Airplanes, factories, countries that have not caught up and have 
a really massive population that trashes their part of the planet. You know, those statistically and just realistically have a way worse influence than our small choices on our nutrition, whereas instead our nutrition choices are negatively influencing our health as a nation and it's putting burdens on families, on our healthcare system. You know, it's it's trickling down in a way where people might be initially thinking that they're improving the environment by choosing a certain milk or fake burger and stuff. And unfortunately, statistically, it is not enough to actually make an impact, but it is enough to make an impact negatively on your health. So that might not be sexy. And I'm sorry if I'm not trying to push any buttons. I'm just being straight up that when you really look at the the big picture here, unfortunately, those things do not make as big of an impact as we think or are sometimes told because it's making us sicker. A lot of times the things that we're choosing instead are making us sicker. And I'm very passionate about talking about that because it is just what's going on, you know, and I'm going to be real with you guys like 24 seven, you know, I think a lot, I've gotten feedback from a lot of you, especially even just in my coaching career that you guys really appreciate the fact that I'm just real about this stuff. I'm not pushing an agenda. I'm just telling you what's up. Okay. And I can also, I will tag that video. It's on YouTube from that Scandinavian company that talks about that so that you can check that out for yourself because I'm not making it up. It's a real, for real thing from real, very smart people who are like, yeah, the fact that you're choosing a different milk instead of cow's milk may not actually be making that big of a difference. (laughs) But I'm not saying I'm a big fan of cow's milk either, um, necessarily. So let's go ahead with all of that said. I think that that's really important to set the table of these conversations, especially starting in season two, because I really want people to make sure that they understand that there is a cost of every decision you make for your health. We're looking at the scope of health. I'm talking about the health, okay? And it doesn't mean that you need to push everything on the wayside so that you can prioritize your health, but there's a balance and that you need to achieve and work towards to have both because you can. And I am definitely all about balance in all the different areas of your life. So I hope that that resonates with you and that you can kind of sit on that, whether or not you agree. I hope you just marinate on it and explore it for yourself. Okay, let's dive into the milk debate. So first, I'm going to talk about the milks. Then I'm going to kind of break down each of them a little bit briefly. Some of them not as brief because they're more popular and have more things to say about them. But at the same time, I want you to make sure that you understand that every milk that you choose, pick what works the best for you. You know, be insightful. How does your body feel when you're drinking it? You know what I mean? You can use one for a couple weeks, see how you feel, then use a different one a couple weeks, see how you feel there. And then that can help you choose what is your go-to baseline milk. It's also good to say that you should consider a variety of different milks. You don't have to just do one. You know what I mean? And in fact, I would say you probably shouldn't just do one. So think about that as we kind of talk through all the different milks today. And at the end, again, like I said, I was going to give you kind of my top three of the golden milks, (laughs) not actually golden milk, golden milk is good, but (laughs) Um, golden top three milk choices that I believe when you stack them up against the other options, they are the superior options with the least added ingredients. Okay, so first, what are the basics of milk nutrition in general? Not just cow's milk, just all the milks. Like what is the point of it, right? So Historically, we started drinking more milk, particularly cow's milk, because we needed to nourish the nation, especially as it grew, in a way that was easier with really dense nutrients. So especially traditional cow's milk, like less adulterated cow's milk. Nowadays, most of our standard milk in a plastic jug in the store is very adulterated. (laughs) That's what I'm going to call it. Um, But traditional cow's milk is super high calcium, vitamin D, protein, it has natural fats, and it has natural carbs in the form of milk sugars. And so it technically is a complete 
meal, quote unquote, because it has all of those nutrients involved in it. It has carbs, fats, and proteins. If you haven't listened to the macronutrient series, episodes 19 through 23, I believe, 22, definitely go listen to those. They're going to rock your world. But (laughs) what I want to make sure you know is that milk was brought into our world because it was an easier way and a faster way to get more nourishment to more people. I mean, it's been around longer. I mean, there were tribes in just different countries that utilize cow's milk, especially Scandinavian countries. More on that in a second. But it's not necessarily in a way where we drank it as frequently as we started to, especially here in the U.S. Um, And that we, you know, pushed towards factory farms for dairy and all that kind of icky jazz. But people like to utilize milk, you know, for cereal, for mixing into oatmeal, for making into like baked goods. You know, there's a whole lot of different reasons people use milks, but it's essentially kind of another way to supplement more nutrients into your diet with something that's like creamier. I didn't really look back into like when cereals became more of a thing, but I do know that cereals became more of a thing because they also were trying to find ways to get more specific nutrients into the growing population, especially after the depression, um, as they were fortifying a lot of these cereals with nutrients that people were um, deficient in. And so I wonder kind of how much milk and cereal kind of went hand in hand, but I do know that people were still drinking glasses of milk, especially if they owned dairy cows and they had a farm. So it's not necessarily super new, but the way we create our milk now is definitely modern. So a lot of the reason people move away from dairy, you know, for somebody like me who at the age of six, I believe I discovered through (laughs) a very delicious bowl of oatmeal with a big splash of whole milk and brown sugar and butter that I was lactose intolerant. (laughs) If you don't know my genetic background, I am like a quarter Japanese and Japanese do not do very well with dairy because genetically, historically, we did not have dairy cows available for us really. Um, And a lot of Pacific Islanders and Asians in general don't really do well with a lot of dairy for that reason. Um, And that kind of brings me back around to the Scandinavian countries and such, um, and and some in like the European areas, is that where your lineage of your genetics are, if you have strong genetics, like if you're a super mutt, like I'm getting into mutt zone, like I call myself a mutt, um, because I do have German and Norwegian from my mother's side. But if you are somebody who's like, super mix, super mix, super mix, like your parents were mixed and then, or your grandparents, your great grandparents, you, you know, if everybody's like mixing, 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 it could be a little bit convoluted for this concept that I'm going to bring up. But if you have pretty strong genetic ties and you know um, your ethnic background, you can determine a lot of what your body will be better at digesting by that. So a lot of Scandinavian countries had a lot of dairy often. And so therefore a lot of, you know, more Caucasian people or just people of that descent in general digest dairy just fine. So there's a lot to be said about not necessarily one size fits all when it comes to is dairy, like cow's dairy bad for you? Because it totally is fine for some people, especially certain quality dairy. Quality dairy matters a ton. We're going to talk more about that. But when you think about it, your body is going to do the best with the most familiar ancestral foods. That is very common. So if you eat more similar to how your genetic lineage has eaten, that can help you have a better gut situation if you are always struggling with digestion and all that kind of stuff. Um, So that's kind of important and interesting to talk about because it's kind of like a the kind of moment when you think about it, but at the same time, you know, we don't really think about it that much. So kind of look back into your genetic history and see what you might actually be good for. And you also can learn what you want because if you're Asian or part Asian like me, you probably are lactose intolerant or something similar because I don't necessarily get like the gassy side of lactose intolerance and stuff, but I do get like sharp intestinal pains and that's just another version of it. So, and then there's also like, you know, for different health reasons that people choose alternatives, there's also, you know, different ethical considerations like I was talking about before. So, And those are separate from environmental when we talk about it. I would say that we would talk about ethical considerations like factory farmed dairy 
not a fan, definitely not. Um, and environmental concerns of like, how much is that actually impacting the environment by you just choosing not to purchase milk? So as far as we've already talked about the environmental concerns, but um, which I'm not going to write off that there are definitely impacts of different industries in the U.S., but I think it's very imbalanced in the way that we are more concerned about our nutrition, like foods, versus let's like pump the brakes on fast fashion. Let's pump the brakes on planned obsolescence for electronics and appliances, like all of these things that have massive footprints that we don't even think about. I mean, think about like movie production, how much they build sets and then they just toss a lot of that stuff after they like get rid of it you know like think bigger think about all these things that we use and we do day to day that needs to be made in a factory with chemicals you know the microplastics episode the pfas episode all of those things are massively impacting us so why are we first trying to remove nourishment from humans as if that is what's really going to have a big environmental you know impact compared to Why don't we stop being a consumer nation in a lot of ways and all that stuff, you know? So I think that that it's really important to more so look at your choices with dairy, from my opinion, from an ethical standpoint versus environmental, because in reality, the environmental standpoint is kind of hogwash, (laughs) um, unfortunately, when you really look at it deeper, you know, versus what all these people are saying this or that. And I do encourage you to look into that deeper if you're going to hold such a strong opinion on it, because I know so many people that have strong opinions, but don't have longer thoughts to back it up. And I really like having humans in the world that think deeper. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so um, ethical considerations, I would say the only thing I'm going to say about that with the cow's milk is there are plenty of sources of pasture raised cows or dairy that are eating grass as they are genetically meant to and are roaming freely on a pasture. So if you're wanting to go for a better quality and sustainably raised dairy, there's a ton of dairy farmers in the U.S. especially that pasture raise. So just look for pasture raised dairy, organic dairy. Um, You know, organic typically is always pasture raised because they are not exposed to the antibiotics and such that factory farmed dairy is because by the nature of all those cows being packed together horribly and you know just milked all day long practically they have to be on medications antibiotics you know all this different stuff and they eat corn because they're just kind of stuck inside all their rows that means that they have to use those so organic dairy doesn't use those so you just really basically want to go towards pasture raised dairy And it's going to be a lot more nutrient dense for you and definitely happier cows. (laughs) That's for sure. So that would be an important thing to note for the ethical side. Uh, And then, you know, plant-based doesn't necessarily have their hands clean either. There's a lot of different major monocrops that contribute to some of the milks, such as soy, oat, and pea, actually. Those are all big crops that do also have their own negative Um, impacts on the environment and, you know, potentially ethically when it comes down to the pesticides they spray on it, the workers that go and spray those pesticides and the laundry list of issues that happens to the families that work on these farms and live nearby and get the off spray from these pesticides, you know, that is also a ethical problem with a lot of these monocrops when it comes to that. So that's, you know, there's a lot of different things to kind of consider if you're going to go down the route of choosing certain milks for ethical or environmental reasons, you know, those are some things that a lot of people don't tend to talk about, but are real things. Um, And I I see it every day. I live in agricultural land out here. (laughs) And I actually have had friends who worked in farming part of their majors in different states. So these are real life things and it's important not to kind of cherry pick how we view stuff just because one thing is the popular narrative and other things are not. So let's talk about cow's milk first. Let's just get that guy out of the way because there's definitely a lot to be said about cow's milk. And it's definitely going to be a l- like a little bit longer of a conversation than the other milks because there's a lot of nuance to it. So we did already talk a little bit about the history of cow's milk, but we tend to like 
cow's milk if you can digest it because it is very nutrient dense, has a lot of good quality vitamin D, calcium. There's a lot of different things involved in cow's milk that are great for the human body, especially if you don't have a lot of access to nutrient dense sources of foods. Speaking mostly about whole milk, like the least adulterated version of the milk, we get a really complete meal, quote unquote, because again, like I was saying, you get a good complete protein source, you get animal sourced fats, so it's bioavailable to the body, and you're getting carbohydrates. So that's why a lot of times people historically used to like say like, oh, you can't sleep, go drink a cup of milk, you know, and people would fall back asleep. Um, most likely that was because they were underfed and they were hungry because your body will wake you up in the wee hours of the night if you um, are underfed. <laughs> um, so it would make sense that milk would be a complete meal that would get them to fall back asleep. And there's also um, components to dairy that actually are relaxing. And um, we're not going to really get into all the nitty gritty on that, but there's a lot of different ways that milk can do that for people. But the difference though, is that we really want to be, if you're going to ask the question of which type of milk is the best, if you're going to have dairy, especially if you're somebody who has, you know, gen genetic, no genetic predispositions that have challenges with milk, I would definitely say, like we were talking about, conventional cow's milk is not ideal. It is highly processed. The cows are given hormones and antibiotics. They eat corn again, so their milk is not as nutrient dense as grass-fed. Um, and there's just a lot of synthetic vitamins that are injected into the milk that make up for the nutrient loss when the milk is pasteurized and homogenized and all of that, especially when they remove the fat. So like 2% milk or 0% or fat-free, you know, all that stuff, which would be 0%. Um, those are not the ideal types of milk. And it does kind of suck because especially like as a kid of the 90s, like I feel like everybody just wanted fat-free milk or 2% milk. And that's like literally the most highly processed cow's milk and just is lacking in so many nutrients, unfortunately. So it's like basically just kind of a milky lake vessel. And if that were the case, I would just go for like a nut milk, you know, but nut milks have really kind of taken off a lot more like late 90s into now. Um, there's definitely used to be some around, but not anywhere like they have now, you know, now everybody's trying to milk everything, <laughs> but yeah. So I would say any type of conventional cow's milk is not what's up. I would avoid it at all costs, especially as a female, because, um, the component of how we make our own milk, it, uh, cow's milk has a different composition than human milk. And weirdly enough, that impacts how females digestive systems, um, digest cow's milk, especially as an adult, because you may have heard the phrase that like, you're not a baby cow. So like, why are you drinking baby cow juice? Um, very similar to that, like males can get away with drinking baby cow juice because <laughs> they don't have much going on interiorly the way that we do. <laughs> we are so complex. And that does come down to also our gut and our gut is much more sensitive to things like casein. And casein is definitely involved, especially in a lot of conventional dairy. It's also found in uh, just all dairy in general, but there are better quality dairies farmers now that have what is called A2 milk. And before I get into the A2 milk, the version of cow's milk I would recommend is always grass-fed cow's milk because grass-fed dairy eliminates all of the problems related to how cows are raised, fed, how their milk is processed, etc. And so that alone is a great reason to switch to just grass-fed cow's milk if you're going to stick with drinking cow's milk. But going back to the A2 is a preferred version of milk. You might actually see this more and more now at the grocery store. I see a ton of those options at Whole Foods. It's definitely the one I reach for when I get my fiance milk, and it's also the cream that I reach for when I get cream because of the current way I'm eating. Yes, I can have cream and not have lactose issues <laughs> because actually most um, cream does not actually have, it has nominal amounts of lactose left in it. That's why it's like, it's not very sweet. Um, anyways, <laughs> side tangent. So beta casein, so the casein protein that is found in dairy, there's casein and whey protein in dairy. Okay. Um, whey isolate 
is like a really common protein you find that is a superfood. It is actually classified as a superfood because of its nutrient density and what it can do for the body, especially muscles. That is the other type of protein. And that one tends to digest very well for most people, especially if like combined with protease, you know, digestive enzymes that help you break those down a little bit better. For me, again, being lactose intolerant, I have always tolerated whey isolates. Isolate means that you've isolated the whey only. There's a lot of protein, like protein concentrate, milk protein concentrate has casein and whey. So protein shakes like Fair Life and such, those involve casein as well. And so some people like me and many of my other female clients who don't really digest casein very well, you should just stick to whey or you can actually reach more for these A2 milks. So um, the beta casein, the main type of beta casein, it has two subtypes. They have labeled them A1 and A2. And to not get too sciencey for you, basically in regular grass-fed, regular grass-fed milk, you find in the grocery store, the A1 subtype is more common because cows in the U.S. have casein gene mutations that happened over thousands of years because of crossbreeding different kinds of cows and all that. But beta A2 casein is the original ancient casein. And beta A1 casein is the reason a lot of people are intolerant to dairy. A lot of studies are pointing to A1 as the trigger for digestive problems and inflammation, all that. A2, on the other hand, has been shown to be more digestible and richer in vitamins and just better for you in general if you're somebody who tolerates cow's milk well. So there's a lot of different, you know, markers that are important to pay attention to if you're choosing cow's milk. Like not all cow's milk is the same. Like I wouldn't say just have grass-fed cow's milk and see how it goes or it's okay if you have regular milk, if you have 2% milk, whatever, you know. No, all cow's milk is not made the same. So it is important to make sure that you're looking for like checking the box of is it grass-fed cow's milk? Is it A2? And it'll say A2 on it. Like it'll it'll be right smack in the front on the label. You won't miss it. Um, and then at the same time, just kind of observe how your body deals with it. I have found anecdotally um, that when for somebody who's more sensitive to dairy like I am, when I have it combined with like highly processed carbs and sugars, the way that the lactose and then the sugars of whatever else I ate interacts with each other causes more of my lactose intolerance. However, when I drink just some A2 milk or A2 cream or whatever, and I'm eating a more, you know, like paleo style, carnivore style diet, I do not have any lactose problems at all. So it's kind of interesting to observe for yourself whether or not the combination of like a croissant and a whole milk cappuccino gives you issues, or if all you had was a whole milk cappuccino and you had maybe some fruit, you know, something natural that's not processed. Test that out for yourself. It is really interesting to kind of observe and see what foods interact with each other or don't. But anyways, all that to say, uh, if you're going to have cow's milk, that would be the choice is the grass-fed A2 cow's milk. But wait, just when you thought the dairy conversation was over, (laughs) raw milk. Let's take a second to talk about raw milk. So raw milk is getting blown up right now because uh, a lot of people are basically realizing that there's a lot of misinformation like that you can die from drinking raw milk and all that stuff. Um, In reality, there seems to be, according to studies and such, that there are far more risks from drinking pasteurized milk than unpasteurized milk for certain people. Um, That's important to note because there still is concerns for pregnant women whether or not you have unpasteurized anything, you know, even unpasteurized juice drinks are still risky for pregnant women. So if you're pregnant, I would not... (laughs) not follow that at all. Um, But the quality is still always the most important part that we pay attention to. So we really want to make sure that if we're drinking raw milk, we want to know that it's from a farm where the cows have good living conditions, they're pasture raised, they have a good environment that's clean, what they're eating, you know, grass and natural feed, and they're not using hormones and antibiotics because that inevitably gets into the milk. Same way that us drinking alcohol, if we're breastfeeding, will make your baby drink alcohol because <laughs> it comes through your milk supply. Um, not just a straight up alcohol coming out your boob, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, it gets into your milk supply. So the things that are interesting about raw milk, if you are somebody who partakes, it is still very interesting. The U.S. has weird regulations on uh, raw milk 
probably for the sense that there are some groups of people who shouldn't partake in unpasteurized foods. Um, but the raw milk that you sometimes see um, at grocery stores, such as like we have a grocery store here called Sprouts, I believe they carry raw milk. Then they say that it's for dogs, but it's actually not for dogs. It's just, they can't market it for humans, but it is human grade. You can drink it. Um, and I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, I don't really know. It says it's for dogs. So, um, but it's actually just marketed that way because to get it on the shelves, they can't say that it's for humans, but humans can totally drink it. But again, you're probably going to want to check and make sure that your current situation is in a position to try drinking raw milk because there are actually a lot of interesting benefits that can come from raw milk that have been, you know, not widely talked about, but a lot more people now are talking about it, especially more people from the functional nutrition side of things, which is definitely my favorite side of nutrition <laughs> because it's just like real down and dirty nutrition of humans. It's not trying to like appease this or that. <laughs> so a few things that are interesting about raw milk is that it's self-digesting so it has all the enzymes it needs to be digested by humans. Uh, so when we're lactose intolerant, like I was talking about, that means I don't produce lactase. Anything with ACE is an enzyme. And that's the enzyme that is necessary to break lactose. Anything with an ose is a sugar um, down. So that's why it gets all pissed off once it goes into my intestines and my intestines get angry at me because it's like, hey, you didn't break this thing down. This thing is supposed to be broken down when it gets to my part. And so raw milk actually contains lactase. So if you don't drink milk at all because of being lactose intolerant, but you do enjoy milk, like you like the taste of it and everything, raw milk would be a good thing for you to try because it does contain lactase in it. So it digests much easier. It's also got a lot of immune system boosting potential because it has immunoglobulins specifically one that's called IgG, like capital G, and it supports immune function. So there's a ton of different studies now that have shown that raw milk consumption is correlated with improved immune system function, which is interesting. And, you know, it wouldn't be super surprising because it's probably with the mechanism that when you're growing a baby, <laughs> you want to have the nutrients available to support it becoming a robust big cow. <laughs> But not in a way where that like is weird for humans because tons of people have been drinking raw milk on their farms for years, you know, when we were all self-sustainable and could take care of ourselves. <laughs> so raw milk has also been correlated with like reduced risk of respiratory infections, fevers, you know, it reduces risk of asthma and allergies. There's a lot of properties to raw milk that is very kind of fascinating in regards to the immune boosting potential. But like I said, it's, it's one of those things that could be kind of hard to find. And if you're somebody who's really interested in it, you probably could reach out to like a local dairy farm and find out where you could find some, or you can look for specialty health stores. You know, those typically will carry things like that because conventional grocery stores like Safeway and stuff, they usually only carry what is actually going to sell. The margins on grocery stores in general are really small. So they're not going to be stocking a ton of these things. And that's why historically you've always found the weird stuff at like Whole Foods and, you know, a variety of different more niche stores. So if you're looking for raw milk, you would want to look for that. And again, you may just want to check, like you can always check with your doctor that you don't have any specific health conditions that might make you at risk for something unpasteurized. You may just want to approach the conversation as, am I really at a risk if I don't have something pasteurized? I don't know. Sometimes guys, like a lot of you, I've had this conversation recently with several clients that went to see their general practitioners. They were very disappointed in the responses that their doctors gave them because they were either dismissed, given a really short half-assed answer or not given any sort of conclusion at all other than just like, probably don't do it. <laughs> and it's like, but why? Or why not? You know what I mean? So that's where like taking your health kind of into your own hands and figuring out what works well for you, but not in a way where you're going to be doing crazy stuff. Raw milk really is not doing something crazy. It may sound crazy because it's been kind of taboo for us for so long, but um, especially if you do little research for yourself and whatnot, you may find that it is quite nutrient dense and beneficial potentially for you. 
So that is something important to consider. But to finish out the conversation about cow's milk, it's, I don't know if you've seen, I mentioned it in the beginning of the podcast, but I don't know if you've been seeing any ads marketed towards you on social media from a company called Armra. They make what is called a colostrum supplement. It's not a sexy name, definitely not. (laughs) But um, what is colostrum, right? Like, what is it for? It is actually a fluid that all animals and mammals rather that feed through breast milk production, essentially. It's a milky fluid that's released before the actual breast milk production begins. So humans produce it. And in the case of this Armra supplement, so do cows. So it's very interesting because it's a highly nutritious fluid. It sounds disgusting, I know, but at the same time, anything you know, that a lot of things <laughs> that come from animals and mammals in general are natural and nutritious for a reason. You know, it's what we came from. You know, we if you were a baby and you breastfed, you know, you had it from your mom. <laughs> so anyways, it actually contains more nutrients than regular milk. So it's higher in protein, fat, carbs, magnesium, B vitamins, vitamins A, C, E, and it actually contains really specific protein compounds that are linked to immune system boosting and a variety of other benefits like hair growth and such, lactoferrin, different growth factors, so that IGF that I had talked about before that you can find in grass-fed milk as well, and different antibodies, which are those immunoglobulins that I have a hard time saying (laughs) that word all the time. And those are used by your immune system to fight bacteria and viruses. So I actually even have a client right now who like, Your girl was always sick. She always would get sick. If there was anybody nearby with like a little tiny virus left, she would catch it still. (laughs) And she's been using Armra for, I want to say seven months now, maybe a little bit longer. And the last several months, especially, which has been through the winter season, she has not been sick at all. And she even had her wedding and all this different stuff, like reasons to really, you know, potentially catch an illness from stress and such. And she hasn't. And so we're like, we're not going to say that it is or it isn't, but there's definitely got to be something to this colostrum thing. So then I started using it. um, I would say I've used it for about a month and a half now. And um, I've I've had a very good immune system for quite a while now um, with the variety of foods and probiotics and different things that I eat and do. But I would say that what I've actually noticed the most for myself is better hair growth and hair quality and as well as my nails and a variety of different things like physically that can be benefited with some of these different protein compounds and such and different vitamins and minerals because they're really bioavailable. And so a lot of times people say like, well, I can just take all of those things in a supplement, right? Yes and no. You know, a lot of the supplement companies that we purchase from, they are usually selling us vitamins that are either low quality and not absorbable. So that's what we would call not bioavailable or they're not in dosages that are actually therapeutic. And so that means that you're not getting enough at a certain threshold to actually stimulate the results you're looking for. And that happens a ton, you know, especially with a lot of supplements because they're supposed to be sold generically to the public. But that's where getting some guidance from a good quality practitioner could help you because then you can find out just how much you actually need to start to feel a difference because that makes a huge difference. I believe I talk about that quite in depth in my supplements episode. You can look back in season one and find that if you want to learn a little bit more about supplements. But I just wanted to mention the colostrum thing because it is, you know, very adjacent to this conversation about raw milk and dairy milk in general. And also too, for fun, I actually just discovered today the Armra team reached out And I am now affiliated with them. So I'm not talking about this because of that. I'm actually just talking about it because it is important to talk about because a lot of people have been asking about colostrum because the marketing has been hardcore. Like They have been doing a very good job of getting their product in front of everyone's face. But you can use the code KayleeLoren10 if you want to try some of Armra's colostrum supplement. And I previously used the little stick packets. I liked them a lot. I would mix them into my whey isolate protein shake in the mornings or afternoons. And you can't taste it at all. 
I think I actually mixed it once into my electrolytes just because I forgot to make something to drink with it. <laughs> and I didn't taste it at all in that either. And I know my client, she mixes it into her matcha, can't taste it at all. So I would definitely recommend that quality company if you want to give colostrum a try. If you're somebody who deals with immune system problems, like you find yourself getting sick often, or you know maybe you are looking to have some better hair growth and such, that is definitely some of the main things that a lot of people get out of using colostrum. Okay, so that wraps up our conversation about milk. If there's anything I missed, I would love for you to reach out and ask me. Um, feel free to message me at any time on any of my um, Instagram accounts, the Kaylee Loren or the Rebel Wellness Podcast. Those are both easy places for you to reach out to me and chat. But that wraps our topic on dairy milk. Let's get into all of the different plant-based milks. All right, so we're going to simmer down on this milk topic as far as the dairy side goes to it. I hope that I answered a lot of your questions and maybe even if I sparked some new ones, you know, you're always open to send me a DM at Rebel Wellness Podcast or at Kaylee Loren on Instagram. Check out the show notes if you want to connect. Ask me some questions or tell me a little bit of your story with dairy. I'd love to hear it. It's been very interesting to me and I will let you guys know that I am currently scouting some raw milk and seeing if I can test that and give a little feedback on my Instagram about like what I think about the taste, how my body reacts, you know, all that kind of stuff, because there's been a lot of buzz on raw milk lately, especially if you're not pregnant, you know, the really the only thing that is concerning for non-pasteurized dairy is if you're pregnant, babies and potential issues with bacteria and different potential issues that can arise when your baby is um, coming in contact with bacteria that your body hasn't dealt with before. But it's actually not that common, especially with well-handled raw milk from sustainable you know, organic farms. So that is something that I personally am going to explore for myself and see how it goes, especially since it is touted as digestible for those of us who are lactose intolerant because it already has the enzymes like we talked about. So today is the end of part one, and I think that you're going to really enjoy part two as we dive a little deeper into all the oat milks, coconut milks, almond milks, and some really interesting information on soy milk. So you're not going to want to miss part two. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We will touch base back on part two here soon in about a week. As always, come join us in our community. You are very welcome to join the wellness monthly newsletter that is at coachkales.com. And I hope that you, if you want to, share this episode to somebody who doesn't think dairy has potential benefits and maybe to help them open their world to more angles of the dairy topic. But all right, that's it for today's episode. Celebrate your strength and nourishment. Walk with confidence and I will catch you next week on another episode of Rebel Wellness. Hey Rebel, I just want to say a huge thank you for tuning in and sharing this space with us. Before we sign off, I've got some exciting ways for you to stay connected and to take your wellness journey even further with me. First up, if you haven't already, make sure to swing by coachkales.com and sign up for our newsletter. It's your go-to source for the latest episodes, exclusive content, and a whole lot more wellness goodness delivered straight to your inbox. Check out the show notes for those high quality tips on nutrition, fitness, and just overall well-being. Follow us on Instagram at Rebel Wellness Podcast and my flagship page at Kaylee Loren. We're all about building a community where we can share, inspire, and grow together. So I would love to see you there. Now, if you're looking to reset and realign after a vacation, a hectic work season, or just because you feel like it's time for a healthful cleanse, I've got something super special for you and it's 100% free. Head over to stand.store backslash kales and download my free realignment detox guide. You can also find it at coachkale.com in the freebies section. I'm sharing my unique holistic approach to help you cut back inflammation, improve your skin, and even shed some excess weight with this guide. So trust me, you're going to love it. Go download it for free now. But last but not certainly least, if you've got a burning health question you'd like answered on the show, or if you're curious about my one-on-one -on -one remote coaching or group courses, don't hesitate to visit my website 
and reach out to me there or hello at kayleelaren.com is my best email for contacting me. I am here to support you on your journey to wellness, so do not feel afraid to reach out. All right, Rebel, catch you on the next episode.